I'm Daniel Decker. I'm a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. My lineage is Salish and Pend Oreille, Nez Perce, Shoshone. Actually, I'm a, have a lineage of seven tribes in my family tree. I'm enrolled uh, there on the Flathead Indian Reservation as Salish and Kootenai. I am currently a partner in the law firm of Decker and Desjardins. Our firm has been in business now going on 10 years, nine years going on 10. I was the managing attorney for the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes Legal Department for some 15 years. Um, and prior to that, worked as in-house counsel for them. They created uh, their legal department while I was working there. And I was the first manager of that department and continued up until the time I left the tribe to do create my own private practice. It was during, mostly during that period of time of the first 15 years of, of my legal experience. I've been practicing law now for nearly 26 years. It was in that first 15 year period of time that as far as working with the Treaty of Hellgate as a document on behalf of the Flathead Nation, and that's what the treaty actually refers to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai people as the Flathead Nation. But on behalf of the Flathead Nation, uh, I had opportunities, and maybe opportunities not quite a quite way to put it, but certainly had uh, legal experience and courtroom experience, both in protecting water rights, fishing and hunting rights, and to some degree uh, gathering rights off the reservation. Some of those were off reservation. The water rights issues were principally on reservation issues, but majority of the hunting and fishing issues were, were off reservation, I should say, although some of them included on. And that's real important because the treaty really reflects a solemn agreement between two sovereigns, actually in this case multiple sovereigns, because the tribes that entered the treaty were all actually self-governing tribes themselves. They all were sovereign entities unto themselves before entering the Hellgate Treaty. The Salish people, Pondere, Kalispell, and Kootenai people were all sovereign entities unto themselves. And they entered into the Treaty of Hellgate with the United States in 1855. What's important about the treaty in terms of those cases that I was involved with were essentially the promises made that should have been kept, but more significantly, in fact, is the fact that the treaty was a way for the tribes to guarantee themselves certain rights that they possessed long before the United States ever came here. And I always like to point out, in 1855, I mean, that's nearly 50 years before Montana even reached statehood. So it was entered into long before there was Montana as a state, but the treaty really in the long haul the beneficiary of the treaty was the United States. The United States had a treaty making area with Indian nations all across North America and the primary purpose that the United States entered into these treaties was to gain from their perspective or Anglo law perspective legal title to land. It really was about getting land from their perspective, from the federal government perspective, as much as I've looked at the history and studied the documents, it's been more about the United States gaining title to vast areas of land and how most expeditiously to do that. And you go to the mid 1800s, the easiest way for the United States to do that was by treaty. And then that time, you're really talking even pre-Civil War. The United States didn't have the masses of soldiers and armies to really defeat tribes. It made more political sense at that stage to enter into treaties with the tribes. But it really was about getting land. The Stevens Treaty Commission, which entered into many treaties across the Northwest with Indian nations, it was really about getting title to land and about expansion of the railroads, of all things. But the treaty on behalf of tribes, tribes guaranteed to themselves property rights, and that's really what it was. It's Old historians have said that if there was no land, there would have been no Indians. 
And in order to gain title to a vast amount of Montana, the Treaty of Hellgate was entered into with the tribes that were there as signatories. And the tribes in turn conveyed basically western Montana as it's known today to the government. They ceded the land to the government. Now the government didn't give the Indian people anything. What they got was Indian people gave them land in exchange that their rights would remain. And as part of that, most of the tribes felt that what they were retaining was their permanent tribal homelands, that they were retaining their homelands. The understanding of the tribes with the Treaty of Hellgate, for example, was that the Salish people would forever have the Bitterroot Valley, which is south of us here, as their homeland. And it was referred to in the treaty as the Lolo Reservation. But the treaty itself describes what is in the treaty as the Jocko Reservation, where the present day Flathead Indian Reservation is at. The present day Flathead Indian Reservation is the Jocko Reservation. The treaty set up permanent tribal homelands, and for the Salish and Kootenai people, that permanent tribal homeland is the Flathead Indian Reservation. That's what it's called today. For us, it's home, but it's the Flathead Indian Reservation as a permanent tribal homeland for those tribes that signed the treaty. But in terms of how I was involved with the Hellgate Treaty as an attorney, it really went to other areas of, of our treaty in terms of rights that were retained as a part of that. And when, to, to cut a shortcut through all of the law, when the tribes reserved the reservation as a permanent tribal homeland, for example, they also reserved the amount of water that was necessary to make it a permanent tribal homeland. And so water rights is a part of that reservation. And that's been a lot of what I've been involved with is water rights. But also the treaty said that the tribes would have the exclusive right of taking fish in those streams bordering and running through the reservation together with all those usual and accustomed places where the tribes fished. Again, adding to that hunting in all of those places where they have hunted before. And it's been clear in law that in those lands that the tribes ceded, that they gave title to the United States, that the tribes retained the right to hunt and fish on those lands, even though they're not the reservation, on those lands that they gave to the United States. It's like a property interest. They kept that right to hunt and fish. And a lot of people, when you talk about it in the sense of property rights, they understand it. When you own land, you can do certain things on land. And you can sell land and keep certain, certain aspects of it. In that sense, the tribes kept the right to hunt and fish on those lands. But to gather roots, berries that they've always done, that was a right that they reserved. In addition to that, it even went to the extent of grazing. And grazing was important to the tribes in the mid-1800s because of the large amount of horse herds that the tribes had. In terms of the tribe's lifestyle at the time, it required a lot of horses. And so grazing was important to them. And so they talked about where to graze their animals and protect that way of life. As a lawyer involved in it, I then had occasions where I defended tribal members who had engaged in hunting off the reservation on, as the treaty calls, open and unclaimed lands, on federal lands, and the fact that they had a right to do it without interference from the state had occasion to do that. And there were cases even before my time that guaranteed that right, my time as an attorney for the tribe. But then the next thing that happened in terms of my experience was in the middle of the summer during the height of irrigation, agriculture would dry up streams. But the treaty guaranteed a right to take fish. Well, you can't take fish unless there's fish in the stream, and fish can't be there unless there's water. And so that got to a point of litigating to protect in-stream flows. To guarantee that right to fish, there had to be in-stream flows. And the courts have upheld that. And it all goes back to the foundation of the Hellgate Treaty. But in terms of those Indian people who are protected by the treaty or those rights of Indian people that are protected by the treaty, 
are only those signatory tribes that signed on to that treaty. And without being a signatory to the treaty, then none of those rights have been protected, and law hasn't protected those rights. So if you're not a signatory to it, then you don't necessarily have access to those privileges of the treaty. And that's the interesting thing that a lot of people don't understand is that the treaty is with the government of those Indian nations. And as a member of those Indian nations, then you have the privilege of exercising those rights. But those rights belong to the tribe as a whole and not to any one individual. And even some Indian people get confused on that and say, I have a treaty right. No, our tribe has a treaty right. We as members have a privilege of exercising that right. Who were the signers of this treaty? What nations? The principal, well, the nations that signed on were what we refer to commonly today as the Scaly, who were the Bitterroot Salish, the Pondere, the Kalispells, and the Kootenai. It was really in those three Salishian speaking tribes are referred to as the Confederated Salish tribes in terms of the title and the Kootenai. So you really had four distinct tribal groups signing on that in and of themselves in the mid-1800s were sovereign entities. Today it's really seen more as Salish and Kootenai, but that's really not how it was entered into 150 years ago. That's well, I'd be the first to tell you that I'm not an expert on all of the Kootenai history, but obviously it was those Kootenai bands that were in Montana and signed on to. Many, I've heard many historians refer to them as the, the Dayton Kootenays or the Elmo Kootenays. But the interesting thing is, it's like all Indian people, you've had the government put, in this sense, a legal line, not a border so much, but a legal line down the middle of families. In terms of the Idaho Kootenays or the Bonner Ferries Kootenays, many of them are cousins and family and of people here. We definitely show that uh, with the Kalispells, where we have Kalispells here, and there's a Kalispell reservation in Washington, and brothers and sisters just on different reservations, but Kalispells, and their rights are totally different because of where they were at at the time the treaty was entered into. And it, it as much as anything, ends up being who's ever around at a place in time for the government to get to sign on to a treaty document. So the government wasn't concerned whether or not, I doubt if they, maybe I shouldn't say I know for sure, but I doubt if they had any real concern if they had all of the Kootenai people represented at the signing. No, what they were concerned about was whether or not they could really represent that they got title to basically Western Montana by the tribes that were at the signing. You, you have these kinds of things happen all over the country. Um, and for the Kootenai, they even have an international boundary between them. I mean, the Kootenai would go into Canada and there's an international boundary right down through the middle of an Indian nation. So a lot of commerce going on and native people traded with one another. And so we used a lot of territory as a part of that. And we went to other native people to, to exchange goods. And so in terms of understanding that, vast areas of land were used as a part of that whole commerce. And we were visiting earlier about relatives at Fort Hall. Well, we traded horses with the Shoshones regularly and with the Nez Perce regularly. And so that meant traveling to all of those places and using those lands in the process. I mean, it's understanding that Aboriginal territory were those lands that people necessarily used. And while there might be some joint use of areas, many peoples used large areas of land. And I think that the important aspect of understanding that is exactly as was said earlier, is that at that time people were subsistence livers. And there were food caches along the way and sometimes hunting parties, we, might, we talk about it as hunting parties and people think, oh, that was something they, went, they were gone for a little while and came back with 
food. No, they, that could last as long as a couple of years. And that that journey out to get buffalo, and we have stories for sailors that go that could only have been clear to the Black Hills in terms of going out and hunting for buffalo and of Bear Butte and other places that are also of religious significance to other tribes or have significance to us as well. But likewise, going down the Columbia River to Kettle Falls, that's, that's something that the people did. So vast areas of land were used, but the Treaty of Hellgate, on the other hand, and as I said before, I think the primary beneficiary was the United States. But there are several things about that. And first and foremost, in my mind, was they wanted title to land. But the second part of that was I think they wanted to make, keep account of where native people were. And how can we keep track of native people? Well, the, the system had already been put together of reservations. Put these people on a reservation, that way we can keep better track of them, rather than having them use all of this territory. In terms of, of land exchange, of the treaty document itself, the tribe ceded basically all of western Montana, those lands west of the Continental Divide, to the present-day Montana-Idaho boundary, which goes along mountain range high points in terms of the geographic division there, basically. So those lands were then ceded to the government legally by the treaty, and they retained the present-day reservation, but it did leave unaccounted for vast areas of land that the tribes used other than those lands ceded within the Hellgate Treaty. And there's also a treaty referred to as the Treaty of the Upper Missouri of the same Stevens Treaty Commission that recognized, and you can look at the document and say, well, that clearly recognizes that the tribes, the Salish tribes in particular, went beyond the Continental Divide to the east and hunted. And it described a common hunting ground area for other tribes other than the Salish, but it certainly is a recognition that those lands were used. But even that treaty, when we talk to our elders and to the historians of the tribe, doesn't recognize the areas and territories that were used because that's in Montana. We use vast areas of land in Idaho as well that were never recognized in the treaty. But yet, studies by anthropologists and historians and archaeologists will all say, yeah, there was tribal presence other than the ceded territory. One of the interesting things, however, was that even with the Idaho Kootenai, there was a hunting case in northern Idaho where the, the Kootenai man who shot a deer out of season in Idaho actually won the case, but the court used the Hellgate Treaty as the basis for finding that he probably had a right to hunt deer on his open and claimed land, but didn't tie it directly to the treaty, but used it as, I guess, really as persuasive argument, not so much as precedent, but persuasive argument to say that this native person had a right to hunt, even though they weren't a signatory to the Hellgate Treaty. Really, for me, today, as a lawyer, as a member of the tribes, the most important thing in many ways is the permanent tribal homeland, but more than that, more than that was the recognition that the United States was dealing with the sovereign government or governments. Without having that distinction, without tribes having that recognition of being a sovereign, it's our sovereignty that protects our culture, that protects our language. If we were not governments unto ourselves, to have that authority, with, without that recognition, of a separate government, we have the right to protect who we are. It, it takes that exercise of sovereignty to do it. If we don't exercise our sovereignty, we will lose it. And we need to exercise it. But without sovereignty, we don't have the basis to protect our culture, to educate our youth, to protect our elders and care for our elders, 
to keep our songs alive, all of that is done with the power that, that we have as a government.